What links this modern sun worshiper to this girl who is about to die? In this reenactment, she is about to be sacrificed to the sun in a ritual practiced many centuries ago on the plains of North America. Continents away, great civilizations built soaring temples, and their priests devoted their lives to the worship and study of the sun. Human sacrifice, fantastic architectural achievement, entire cultures dedicated to the sun. Are these also haunting reminders of earlier civilizations? Or do these silent sentinels point the way to the future? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. This Aztec calendar depicts a vengeful sun at its center, a god who could only be appeased with human blood. Over the centuries, our views and our rituals have changed. We can hardly wait for the first sparkle of morning light to rush to our meccas of solar worship. To the beaches, the mountains, the deserts, anywhere that we can put on ritual garments, cover ourselves with soothing ointments, and dedicate our bodies to the sun. Technology has brought the sun indoors for year-round worship. Does a vengeful sun god still exact his price? This is skin cancer. I'm a sun worshiper. I spend an awful lot of time in the sun, and I always have, up until the time I had the cancer. John McMahon was cured of skin cancer by Dr. James Sternberg. The problem is that most of these people who are going out and getting tans don't understand what they're doing to themselves, because the sun really can be hazardous. You know, and you don't think about the harmful as aspects of the sun, because it's wonderful, it's warm, and it's a lot of a social thing in there, and uh, nobody thinks about the cancerous aspects of it. Nobody. The important thing is that you understand what the sun does. Each individual person can make their own decision on whether or not they want to get sun or not. Is the same sun that once demanded human sacrifice now the key to human survival? And there are several forms of solar energy that are ready to use right now. Too many people have been misled to believe that the sun is going to solve all of our problems. We could achieve 100% use of solar energy. There's no way that this can be done in this century. For a century and a half, we have mined our planet for fuel. But the Earth and her resources are not limitless. There are signs that nature is beginning to choke in the grip of technology. How long can we afford to ignore a source of energy greater than any that man has created? We need to have power now. Robert solar Deitch of Southern California Edison does not believe solar technology is ready. But in order to meet our demands in the 1980s, we're going to have to depend on the conventional technologies that we know and that we can install now, and that is coal and nuclear. Dr. Barry Commoner of Washington University has doubts about nuclear energy. Nuclear is not renewable. Uh, nuclear energy, as we now use it, is based on uh, burning up uranium. And uh, if we built all the nuclear power plants that we're supposed to, uh, the uranium supplies would run out in 25 to 30 years. That's why we have to turn to solar energy. The search for a solar future starts with a trip back, almost to the Stone Age. Back to these Indian dwellings literally carved out of the side of a mountain. The Indians of Mesa Verde scratched their existence 
from the hostile soil of the Colorado desert. They survived against the freezing winters and burning summers. They protected themselves against the elements in houses heated and cooled by solar energy. Without machines or technology, the Anasazi Indians created these houses that shaded themselves in summer and in winter stored needed heat in thick stone walls. Do these lessons hold any value today? This house uses techniques developed over 800 years ago. Bill Wilson, an expert in solar energy, explains the more advanced techniques used. Active solar is a situation in where you are capturing the sun by use of a collector and then using a pump or a blower to move that heat someplace else where it will be utilized or stored. These rocks store the sun's energy and make it available at night and on cloudy days. The technology may seem simple, but the fact is the sun provides most of the heating and cooling needed here, and the sun is absolutely free. An even greater test of the techniques developed at Mesa Verde occurred here in Modesto, California. Using only light from the sun, this commercial greenhouse maintains a controlled environment essential for the growth of vulnerable young plants. How does it differ from greenhouses that rely on conventional energy sources? The design is intended to heat and cool the greenhouse with minimum energy input and is proving very successful so far. In the winter time, the sunshine comes through that skylight and gives us a very broad band. In the middle of winter, it strikes these barrels and they'll soak up the heat to keep the house warm. In the summertime, you'll notice the X implies that we have no direct sunshine coming in, but we have enough light to give our plants uh, the energy to grow well by the fact that we're bouncing it off the reflective roof and off the white ceiling. This greenhouse is staying cooler by five or 10 degrees with no energy input than are the two commercially designed greenhouses uh, which have electrical cooling. Sunshine, universal, inexhaustible, and free. It is clear that the legacy of the Mesa Verde Indians is a valuable and practical lesson. But 800 years of scientific and technological development have increased our ability to exploit the sun and its enormous store of power. In Modesto, California, scientists are releasing solar energy from sewage and running city vehicles at a cost of only 35 cents a gallon. In order to understand this process called biomass, we must realize that every living thing gets energy from the sun. This energy is stored in every plant, in every leaf, in every flower. And when plants die, their energy can be recaptured as methane gas. Is it possible that America's great farmlands could become a source of fuel? According to Bill Wilson, the answer may be yes. The Modesto plant is doing nothing more than taking what was before a wasted fuel, uh, taking some of the unneeded gases out of it, compressing it, and using it to run the pickups and cars for the city. The plant is producing methane at 35 cents a gallon and producing 1,000 gallons per day. A seemingly impossible dream is becoming a reality in this laboratory in Santa Monica, California. Solar energy is turning water into fuel. This Jeep runs on hydrogen made from water. Gerald Schafflander pioneered a new process to make automotive fuel. It relies on free energy from the sun to manufacture hydrogen. We make a liquid hydride, which we call high fuel. 
that's non-flammable, that's very inexpensive, is done through a well-known process called the Haber process. The process starts with this solar cell. It turns light into electricity. In normal use, the light would be sunshine. When the solar cells are arranged in collectors like these, the sun's energy is focused and multiplied. The electricity created produces hydrogen, but hydrogen is explosive. In this synthesizer, it combines with ammonia to create a safe liquid called a hydride. It is the fuel that powers this engine. We can make modest changes in the carburetor and the fuel line, uh, a modest change in the gas tank, and we can run any vehicle, any vehicle, any standard car can, can be converted now in about three hours to run in our high fuel. A simple Jeep, but with a new carburetor and the addition of this pressure regulator, it now runs on solar-created hydrogen fuel. The exhaust is almost entirely water vapor. Soon, this non-polluting solar fuel may be sold to the public for only 59 cents a gallon. From the simple stone dwellings of the ancients, we have taken many steps toward a solar future. What new technologies will tomorrow's sunrise reveal? Lacking the oil resources of its neighbors, Israel is turning to an intriguing form of solar energy. Israel was the first country to move forward into solar energy, both Tom Hayden, chairman of SolarCal, explains. And they have a, a project at the Dead Sea called a solar pond, and it generates electricity, and potentially it could generate the 3,000 megawatts of electricity that the whole country needs. The Dead Sea absorbs and stores heat from the sun because of the extreme amount of salt in its water. A natural property of salt water is the ability to retain heat. A layer of fresh water is added to trap the heat at the bottom, where the water becomes so hot, it actually boils. The steam created can run a turbine and generate electricity. We see solar ponds having a wide area. Bob French of Jet Propulsion Laboratories is an advocate. <clears throat> we can use that 200 degree source temperature for heating houses or for heating greenhouses, for drying crops. Uh, in certain industrial applications, it can be used. We even think we can use it for desalinating water. This potent source of power is not confined to the ancient waters of the Dead Sea. At the Salton Sea in Southern California, Israeli and American scientists are working on a similar project. Without burning a drop of oil or using an ounce of uranium, this project could supply the daily needs of 600,000 people. I am very excited about solar ponds, and I think that holding it in perspective, it can be one major element in our quest to solve our energy problems. It's not the solution, but it is a piece of it. Uh, which is Robert Deitch of, of Southern California Edison. Solar energy has a place in the future. There's no question about that. It's a matter of how much and how fast we get solar energy. How much, how fast? These questions are a prime concern of Sandia Laboratories in Albuquerque. We spoke to the director, Glenn Branvold, about the potential of photovoltaic cells. Photovoltaic cells are, are a relatively new invention, uh, something like only 25 years old. A solar cell is one of the simplest devices you can think of. You take one of the most common materials on Earth, silicon, purify it, put a very small amount of electrode material on it, expose it to sunlight, and electricity flows. No moving parts, nothing to wear out. Kind of the ideal solar to electric converter. Can this simple device be even more efficient? Sandia engineer, Glenn Schaefer, explains one approach. 
we can use a concentrating lens such as this one to concentrate the sunlight onto the solar cell and thus replace expensive solar cell with a low-cost lens. It turns out nature is occasionally kind. If one doubles the sunlight illumination on a cell, you get more than twice as much electricity out. Presently, we're designing systems with optical concentrations of, as we say, 50 to a couple of hundred suns illumination. And uh, the prospects are encouraging that these kind of systems, in fact, can be lower cost than flat panel silicon cells. Producing electricity in a laboratory is one thing, but can photovoltaic cells work under actual conditions? Strangely enough, the search took us back to a desert landscape like the one seen from the cliffside dwellings of Mesa Verde. The village is Chuchulik, and the 95 people who live here are Papago Indians. Many generations of their people are buried in this parched soil. In many ways, the passing generations have brought little change. The people of Chuchulik still struggle against the elements to raise their livestock and eke out a living under a burning sun. Until recently, the town had no electricity. The villagers gathered water by hand from a single well. The only sources of light were candles and kerosene lanterns. In 1978, Chuchulik became the first community in the world to rely entirely on solar power. These photovoltaic cells were installed by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. They create 3.5 kilowatts of electricity, which can be stored in this special cluster of batteries. David Santos, chairman of the village, monitors the system. In spirit, at least, he is a descendant of the cliff-dwelling Indians of Mesa Verde, pioneering a solar future. Well, what the NASA people put in uh, was the refrigerators and uh, a washing machine and a sewing machine and uh, also the water pump, the runs the water pump. Everything is automatic. A single washing machine, electric lights, refrigeration, a humble step, perhaps, but a fundamental one for these Papago Indians. They do believe that they are happy with the, the lights and uh, out of their refrigerators, they're getting ice cubes and, and the washing machine. I, think, I believe they're pretty happy about it. Today, there is electricity in Chuchulik. What does the future hold? Can solar energy meet the demands of a growing technological society? At this point Glenn Brambolt of Sandia Labs. Fly. The country is a big country. We need a lot of energy for a variety of purposes, both centralized and decentralized. To do that with solar would require land size the size of the state of Oregon. These huge mirrors are still now. They are part of an experimental power plant called a central receiver tower. When these heliostats begin to move, they will act as a concentrating lens the size of eight football fields. Computer control allows each mirror to track the sun with total precision. As they begin to move and turn their reflecting surfaces skyward, the mirrors will multiply the power of the sun over 2,000 times. The heat generated will be so great that our in search of crew was only allowed to film the process from the safety of ground level. Liquid in the boiler at the top of the tower will be heated to temperatures of up to 4,000 degrees. This superheated liquid could be used to generate electricity without the use of oil or uranium. The forecast for solar thermal systems, whether from center receivers or line focus technology, suggests that within the next five or 10 years, really mostly depending on volume production, that energy can be delivered at cost competitive with energy from oil or natural gas. This is an experiment, 
But at this moment, a working power plant is being built at Barstow, California. Its 1,900 heliostats will produce 10 million watts of electricity. That facility it will operate and cost on the order of 90 cents per kilowatt hour once it's in operation. And this is a cost to the customer. Whereas other energy sources, for instance, today, our nuclear energy costs approximately 1.7 cents per kilowatt hour. Oil generation costs approximately 4 to 5 cents per kilowatt hour, and coal approximately 2 cents per kilowatt hour. So there's a vast difference in cost. Dr. Barry Commoner. It's entirely possible, as I've said, uh, to have solar devices that are bad, uh, that are economically costly, uh, and even solar techniques that are harmful to the environment. I think one should be very careful about uh, creating a new solar mythology. From solar worship to advanced solar technology, there seems little doubt that our civilization will build its own temples to the sun. Solar power may never meet all of our energy needs. The future may be unclear. But here, in the isolated village of Chuchulik, right now, it works. A lot of people don't understand what the sun can be used for, and I don't either, but I, I, I know, I mean, it's doing it because I work, it, work at it, and um, so I know what the sun can do, and I'm happy about it.